If you want to learn more about finding red foxes and photographing them, this is the place. Today's guest is naturalist and author Matt Miller. Welcome back, Matt. Thanks for having me, Kirby. Oh, my pleasure. So red fox behavior is fascinating, so let's talk about that first. Uh, tell us about some of the myths and mi misconceptions about red foxes. Yeah, well, red foxes are really one of the most widespread and abundant carnivores in the world. They are found across Europe, Asia, North America, into North Africa, and they've been introduced to Australia where they're an invasive species. But that brings up one of the most common myths here in the United States. And that is that a lot of people have this idea that red foxes here are not native, something I hear again and again, or were really augmented by fox introductions from Europe. Um, after all, George Washington and some of the founding fathers brought red foxes from Europe for hunting purposes. However, um, genetic studies have revealed that the foxes that we have in the East, the Southeast, and the West are all North American in origin. Those foxes brought in for hunting contributed little to nothing to the gene pool. Now, foxes are a lot more abundant than they would have been in the days of the Revolutionary War and this country's founding. Um, and that's because a lot of the larger predators have been uh, eliminated across a large swath of the country. And so um, red foxes have expanded and prospered alongside humanity. So you can find them now in farm country, in suburbs, and even urban areas, which is great news for anyone who, who likes to look for and photograph wildlife because they're a beautiful animal. Um, they stand out often in sharp contrast to the snow. And uh, so they're the, the perfect carnivore for just about anyone to search for and find. Yeah, I wish it were that easy, but... Uh... Yeah. Where can you expect to find foxes then, uh, other than where you just described? And uh, do they come in other fo uh, other colors other than red? Yeah, the, uh, that, that's a, a great question. And of course, you know, as you made reference to, they are all around us, but they are not always the easiest to find. You know, the craftiness of foxes goes back to you know, fables and fairy tales up to modern movies and children's books. We all know that the fox is a crafty character. Um, and that's part of what makes finding and photographing one so rewarding. Um, they're there, but you really need to use your field craft and you know, outdoor skills to, to find them. But um, th there are some areas that I've found to be um, really great for foxes and um, one are like river green belts. Um, here in Boise, Idaho, where I live, we have a fantastic river green belt trail. And it's uh, incredible for all kinds of wildlife, including foxes. But what makes it good is that there is the habitat, um, but it also is not wilderness per se. So the foxes don't necessarily have to contend with larger predators although we do have coyotes and bobcats here that share the green belt as well. Now, in places like Yellowstone, um, there's some evidence that the reintroduction of wolves has meant an increase in red foxes. Um, and I actually saw my first red fox in Yellowstone National Park on my last visit there. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I found that it's very hard to count on them in places like that. Actually, the suburbs, and trying to find signs of foxes can be um, really helpful in pinning them down. Now, as far as colors, red foxes come in a variety of colors. Here in the West, 
Um, you know, I, I mentioned that European red foxes have not contributed to the gene pool, but um, in the West, um, foxes from the East are part of the gene pool due to the once widespread practice of fur farming. Now, as with any wild animal on fences, the foxes escape. Sometimes the fur farms went belly up and people just released them. And those fur farms raise animals of many different colors. And so you will see in the West sometimes what they call a silver fox, which is a fox that sometimes almost looks more black, but can also look very, very gray, but a silvery gray, not like a gray fox, which is a separate species. Um, there are also cross foxes, which are a mix of red and black. And I have seen um, both forms of fox around Idaho. Um, they're actually um, not uncommon. Yeah, the ones I, I've seen, uh, a couple, at least one of them look like a cross fox to me anyway. So we'll take a look at that after a bit and uh, see what you think. Yeah. So one of the skills you mentioned uh, is tracking. So uh, how do we go about tracking them in the snow in particular? Yeah, so a fox has a, a quite distinctive track. It leaves little round paws and you can barely see the claws, but they, they look very rounded, not much like a dog, and they go in a straight line. And you know, if you track a coyote or e even a dog, You'll notice that they are kind of, they have attention deficit disorder. They're easily distracted. But I always say like a fox looks like it knows where it's going. You know, like you will see this line trailing through the woods. And um, that makes tracking them uh, quite possible. The, the key, especially for a photographer, is to be scanning way out ahead because in the winter, Sometimes the fox will find a hillside in the sun and actually be laying out there sunning itself, sometimes with its tail tucked over it. And so you want to be thinking kind of a, a step ahead of the fox. Now, one of the interesting things about foxes is that they will become more nocturnal the more humans are around, but they are not um, as nocturnal as some of the urban predators like raccoons, skunks, and coyotes. Yeah, that, that's, you can see the kind of rounded footprint and the, the claws are not as visible as they would be on a, a coyote or, or dog track. And they're considerably smaller as you can see with that, that dime for, for reference. I, I find them a really a, an appealing little track and, and also that that straight line that they walk in. Um, it just seems to align with with how we follow. Um, and and an, I'll mention a great resource and it's the Peterson's Field Guide to North American Tracks and Signs um, by Olus Murray, who's a old time naturalist, but it's a classic and uh, can help you locate foxes and other animals. Okay, that's good to know. I'll put that in the show notes so people can find it. So aside from the tracks, they also have a distinctive smell, don't they? Yeah, and that that's something this time of year is the, the breeding season. And so they do scent mark and it's kind of a, a unique odor that you might smell as you're tracking them or you might just find, you know, if you're walking along a green, bat, green belt path or a hiking trail, you might notice this odor that is like kind of part skunk, part wet dog, if, if you will. And uh, you know, not, not pleasant by any means. Um, and it, it's a, uh, you know, a musky scent, but the fox uses us, they're very territorial. They'll mark their territories. Their territories can actually be quite small in urban and suburban areas where there's lots of food resources. Um, but an, another interesting thing is they will mark um, bits of prey. So you might find a, uh, a bone or a, a, a wing or, or something and it will have that scent. And the thought used to be that they mark this to warn off other foxes, but it's quite the opposite. 
it's actually cooperative behavior. And it's saying, you know, I've eaten the edible parts of this. There's nothing really to eat here. You know, you can, you don't have to waste your time. And, uh, you know, is that altruistic? Probably not. It's probably to keep a fox moving, you know, like kind of move along. But, uh, <laughs> but it, it is an interesting facet of uh, fox behavior. There's a lot of communication going on with these animals. Um, even if it might seem like they're this quiet, solo critter out there. Yeah, interesting. So you mentioned we're in mating season, which is usually January and February, although I've seen some references that say it may be December and March, but January and February seems to be the prime season. So one advantage of that is that they're more active during daylight hours, which... Uh, gives us the opportunity to get more photo ops. Yeah, they are they are quite active during the day. And, you know, if you look at a lot of fox images, uh, an awful lot of them are in the snow. And one, you know, they're well furred. They're quite striking. You know, in, in the summertime, they can look kind of scrawny and, and thinner because they just don't have that thick luscious coat. But another reason is because they're out there, they're active, um, you know, they're, they're seeking mates, but they're also doing some hunting for voles. And um, you know, kind of the classic photo is a fox springing in the air. They kind of spring up on all fours and then pounce down through the snow to, to dig out voles and, and other rodents. So um, they're very active soon, uh, you know, come March or April, um, they'll be setting up den sites and um, yeah, but right now they're, they're out and about. Okay, good to know. So uh, red foxes are also more vocal during mating season. Uh, can you use those sounds to track a fox? Well, yeah, and you might, yeah, you, know, you, you might, uh, know a fox is in your neighborhood if you hear one during the night and you will recognize it. You know, some sources liken it to a child being tortured. So in other words, it is really an awful sound. It will get your attention. If you hear that, you know, a fox is around and it, it's time to get out the camera and track them down, even if you hear it during the night. But, uh, um, you know, there are a number of things that kind of have creepy sounds. Great horned owls don't always hoot. They have kind of a, a shriek they give out in the middle of the night. Um, peacocks, if there are someone keeping peacocks, they also have a really kind of hideous mating call that people might report as a child in trouble. But the red fox is kind of in a league of its own when it comes to creepy calls. And we just heard a few of them there in the background. So so when are these fox kits born and how long do they stay with mom and dad? Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned with the breeding season, how like some sources say it starts in December. Some say it goes through March. And part of the variance you'll see is for all these estimates is because of the fox's wide range. You know, this is an animal that you can encounter in the southeastern United States. You can find them in Alaska. You know, you can find them on other continents. So, of course, there is some variance, but um, March to April, the, there will be fox kits. Um, they will stay at the den site for, you know, 50 to 60 days, depending on food resources. And they'll hang out in the territory with their parents because the, the mated pair will stick together and help bring food and, and raise the young, if you will. And uh, they'll, they'll stick around that territory, um, you know, into the September or the fall uh, when they will disperse and the males will disperse farther. Um, and, but the females may set up territories um, fairly close uh, to their parents. So, um, you know, you can find foxes year round and, um, you know, as the, the, the foxes disperse, you might have better luck finding them. 
Um, but the key is to you know be out there, be looking, and, and look for the signs because um, again, th this is your your neighborhood animal. In cities, they can be quite secretive, but they are findable. And Kirby, do you have any tips for photographing and and finding foxes and getting that perfect shot of this charismatic animal? Yeah, I think uh, getting the uh, perfect shot is uh, is the hard part, but. Uh, even harder is uh, finding them in the first place, as I mentioned earlier. So all the information you've given us about uh, that is uh, extremely helpful and uh, learning to track them and listen for them uh, certainly would be helpful. So uh, dens can be a good location for photography. Uh, obviously, you have to use extreme care in this location so you don't disturb the foxes or the kits. This means using a long lens in the 500 to 600 millimeter range, concealing yourself well and using camel clothing or a blind for maximum concealment. If you disturb the site, the vixens will move the den and then you'll be out of luck and so will anybody else, plus disturbing the, the feeding of the kits and uh, the uh, other activities of the foxes. So. You don't really want them to be disturbed, so use care. I'll put some references in the show notes about dens and where to find them because it's quite detailed information, but well worth knowing. Knowing, that is. Aside from the mating season, they're most active around dawn and dusk, like a lot of animals. So in addition to uh, what I mentioned about the dens, the best photos are those when you can get down to eye level, which is ideal, but not always easy for an animal that's uh, frequently on the move. Be stealthy, as I mentioned. Using a long lens in the range of five to 600 millimeters is ideal uh, if you want that good close-up uh, shot of a fox. Learn how to track them like we talked about. Like most wildlife, they're creatures of habit, so Observation is the best guide, so once you find a den or find a track, then you can go back to the same location and observe them and find the best place to set up to photograph them. I've got a few fox photos, not as many as I'd like, uh, so I'm going to share my screen. We'll take a look at a few of them and kind of talk about them. So this is uh, what looks to me like a uh, cross fox. You see this okay, Matt? Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful image, and yeah, it, it really has a, a delineation of the reddish into the brownish, really yeah. interesting colors. Yeah, it's not the typical red fox, uh, and as you mentioned, uh, it looks a little scrawny here in the <laughs> in the springtime. Uh, so catching up on the food supply, I don't, I can't tell if this is a male or female. I don't know how easy that is to tell from a photograph, but. Uh, if it's a yeah, female, it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it's not, not easy to tell, yeah. So you would guess that if this is a female, she's still recovering from nursing her kits and feeding them and all those sorts of things. So this was taken in Yellowstone and um, occurred more by habits, happenstance than uh, by planning. Uh, I was driving in the Lamar Valley and saw a bunch of people that appeared to be photographing birds. So I uh, grabbed my camera and tripod and walked up this little hill to uh, see if uh, I could spot what they were looking at. And uh, I never did figure out what they were looking at, but I was standing there and all of a sudden this uh, fox comes out and uh, uh, I got about... Uh, 50 some shots of it as it traveled across this little meadow doing various things. And so we'll see a, see a couple of them. In those days, I was uh, shooting with a, a D, Nikon D4 and a 600 millimeter lens. So even though I was up on the hill looking down on them, the long lens tends to uh, overcome some of that so it doesn't look like you're shooting straight down on them at least. And uh, in some positions, it almost looks like a head-on shot, but not quite. So this fox just uh, 
I uh, was minding its own business, didn't probably knew that I was there, but didn't care, and kept moving across the meadow. And every once in a while, he, he or she would pause to have a look around. And then he'd, he or she would continue on her way and crossing this uh, fallen tree. And as you wow. as you mentioned, uh, they're always in a hurry and look like they're on a mission. And mm -hmm. uh, this one certainly did that. Uh, I love the expression here and the, the open mouth. You can see the tongue and and uh, fortunately, uh, all pretty sharp. Even though those were that was an old camera in terms of detail technology, but uh, a very sharp lens. So uh, it rendered some uh, pretty nice photos as far as I was concerned anyway. Oh, yeah. So this is the typical hunting behavior in the wintertime. This was also in Yellowstone. I was on a winter photography uh, workshop and uh, just happened to see this. It's not a great photo because uh, he or she was about a half mile away, and so it's even with a 600 millimeter lens, uh, the fox is uh, not real sharp and uh, it's not an ideal picture like you sometimes see, but uh, gives you an idea of how they spring into the air and they go head first into the snow. Uh, and uh, they're, if I'm correct, they're usually listening for voles and, and mice. And once they hear them, they jump up and uh, and dive in head first and uh, fairly successful with us as far as I know. Yeah, that that yeah, that is the the classic behavior and cool that you got to see that. And it's great that you've had these encounters in Yellowstone. As I mentioned, I've spent a fair amount of time in the park, but uh, my my encounter on my last trip, I was actually I was working on a story about West Slope cutthroat trout. Uh, which have been reintroduced into the park and I was fishing and kind of losing myself in the fishing and it was dusk was approaching and all of a sudden I heard something creeping up behind me well in Yellowstone you don't really want something creeping up behind <laughs> you <laughs> and so I kind of jumped out of my skin and I swiveled around and uh was relieved to find and also surprised to see that a fox had creeped up quite close and was curious about me they you know, where they are not pressured by humans they can be quite curious creatures and, and that was the case with this one and it, it's interesting because its coloration was very similar to the one you showed walking through the meadow uh, okay yeah i'm not sure about the uh of the etiology of that, but uh, be interesting to know. I suppose somebody has studied it, but if so, I don't know who or where. So, uh, were you in the Lamar Valley fishing, or uh, the the West Slope cutthroat trout are uh, actually located along the Gibbon River, oh, so okay. uh, between Madison and and Canyon. But the Lamar Valley, of course. Um, as you know, is a, a special place for naturalists and wildlife photographers alike. Yeah. Yes, it is uh, often called the uh, Serengeti of uh, of uh, North America. Yeah. Yeah, and rightfully so. So you wrote a nice article about uh, red foxes in winter. Where can people find that and find everything you do? Yeah, so I am um, editor and lead writer for Cool Green Science, which is the online publication of the Nature Conservancy. And you can find that at blog.nature.org. And there's a variety of topics, but one of my favorites is helping people enjoy their backyard wildlife. Um, so you will find articles on how to find red foxes and bobcats, coyotes, and a very long list of birds that you might commonly encounter around your city or neighborhood or backyard. Yeah, that's always great info. So uh, thanks uh, for sharing that stuff. And uh, people should uh, subscribe to your uh, 
mailing list for that for Cool Green Science, and uh, we'll learn a lot about it. And uh, I always enjoy reading it. I know, I know that. So thanks for all the great info, Matt. The information you provided should help for should help photographers find foxes and track them and better understand their behavior. Well, yeah, thank you again for having me, Kirby. Always a, a pleasure to talk wildlife with you. And uh, I hope all your listeners get out and, and search for foxes or whatever the critter is around their homes. So each episode of Photograph from the West is published on the 15th and 30th of the month, except this month, of course. Uh, tune in on March 1st for an episode on bird photography with Bayou Josh. Bye for now.